on the News Channel 5 Network, this is Inside Politics. Hello everyone, I'm News Channel 5's political analyst Pat Nolan. Welcome to Inside Politics. Since the end of January, it's been a pretty tumultuous time in Metro Nashville government and at the courthouse. There's been a scandal and resignation involving the now former Mayor Megan Barry. Swearing in followed to that of Vice Mayor David Briley followed. He's assumed the post of mayor until a special election can be held. That vote will now take place on May 24th, but it took a weeks long battle that was decided by the Supreme Court before that date was set. And of course, there's the controversial Metro Transit referendum, which is on the ballot May 1st and early voting has already started. To put all these ongoing developments into some perspective, our guests today are in, on Inside Politics, our Tennessee reporter, Joey Garrison, and Nashville scene reporter, Stephen Hale. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us. It's been kind of a crazy time over the courthouse, right, Joey? Yeah, it really has. The last three months or so, I guess, starting in late January, it's been like nothing I've uh, seen in Metro government or covered. Uh, Stephen, uh, let's start with the trans vote. It seems to be getting more and more contentious as we get closer and closer down to the race. So why is that? Is it, does it mean the race is close? It seems like it to me. I mean, I think part of it is just that anything this expensive and this uh, city altering is going to be contentious. Uh, but it's interesting, and the early vote is a good early vote for a May vote, but we, vote, we voted over a quarter of a million people for president two years ago, and yet the early vote has only been about 3,500 votes mm -hmm. voters a day. We're up right now as we, as we tape this show about, about 27, 28,000. We might get close to 50,000, but those are not very high numbers when you see how many registered voters have. Are the, the voters not connecting with this? Why do we have such a low turnout? You know, that's a... Good question that I don't have a great answer for. I mean, other than the fact that it is kind of happening in isolation, there are judicial primaries, but a lot of those races are vague and hard to understand for people too. And you and can vote for one or the other, and you can vote for both, but you don't have to vote, if you vote for the referendum, you don't have to vote in the Democratic primary. Right, and so I think even though the, the transit issue has been getting a lot of attention, it can be kind of hard to penetrate for some people, um, and, and then they may not be showing up for it. Joey, with a vote this small, um, who does that help? Does that help the proponents for transit or the opponents? Well, I mean, it's small compared, as you say, to presidential elections, but let's compare it to other pro past high-profile referendums in Nashville's mm -hmm. history. 125,000 voted on the Oilers, Tennessee Oilers Stadium back in 96. Uh, uh, about 75,000 voted on the English only. So we're looking kind of maybe between those, between two. those two. So I, th I think maybe we're going to have like 80, 90, 95,000. And so that's sort of, when you look at the, that's maybe a little higher than some people were actually predicting for this election. I think that helps, uh, or it's an encouraging sign for the pro-transit referendum folks, if I had to pick one or the other on that. But, uh, you know, and then with so many uncertainties in this election, even that's not sort of a guarantee there. Stephen, which side is doing the best get out the vote campaign, or are both sides doing a get out the vote campaign? It's a little hard to discern in some cases. Yeah, you know, I think, I don't know about uh, how this translates to get out the vote exactly, but I do think that, frankly, the, the pro-transit side has a harder, uh, a higher bar to clear. I mean, it's, it's harder to make the case for something that's complicated and big and expensive like this than it is to point out all the potential flaws or the potential alternatives. And I think that they're, they're getting targeted from a bunch of different angles. There are a lot of different opposition groups that have propped up. Some of them are connected, some of them aren't. And I think the pro-transit side is kind of having trouble making a coherent one coherent argument you know, that'll Joey, get through. Joey, usually in a lot of races, the first day of early voting, we have all these people rallying, going to the polls. I didn't see a lot of that. It didn't, and actually it seemed to me the numbers for early voting was at, were actually slightly higher the second day of early voting than the first day. Yeah, it's almost like if there weren't a couple stories pointing out that early voting was happening, people <laughs> wouldn't have known it. But I, going back to the question you asked Stephen there, I will say, I think in the final days here, what you've seen messaging-wise from the pro side is a real attempt to sort of rally, I would say, a democratic base around it. And you see that by them pointing out the uh, the, Coke, uh, the, uh, the Lee Beeman connection and trying to to uh, you know, fan the whole Koch brothers thing, the trust, uh, the there's a mailer out that uh, Calls about, talks about Trump lies, Trump right? Trump lies, lies, that kind of thing. Yeah. So I think here and, at the end, and, yeah. the pro side is saying, "Hey, we have got to make this a D versus R race." And I think that was sort of the always the plan as much as possible. But here at the end, that's the, sort of their last push to try to get this thing passed. Steve, we also have this dark money controversy that's come in. It looks like the people that are opposing it, the no tax for tracks, are receiving 75% of their money from one outside pack that doesn't disclose who their donors are. Mm -hmm. Do the voters care? How's that going to play in this race? You know, I think it's my gut would be that the people who care about that are probably already decided on the issue. I'm not sure how many people are swayed by that. I think it's possible that it's a good voter turnout 
um, strategy to accentuate that, to highlight that, because people who, like like Joey's saying, people who are Democrats or people who are f find the connection to Lee Beeman and the Koch brothers sort of distasteful, this dark money thing might motivate them to really defeat that opposition. But I'm I'm not so sure how many people's minds it it changes. Yeah, and it was no doubt something that the pro side actively pushed out there. They held a press conference outside of Beeman Automotive. They were more than happy to get that kind of coverage, uh, you know, pointing out, hey, the 750000 of the $950,000, uh, you know, uh, collected by No Tax for Tracks is from the, a 501c4 who doesn't have to close, disclose their donors. I mean, that was something that they were more than happy to talk about. Their last TV ad, the, the attack ad that's on right now, basically talks about um, vote for the truth. Uh, that's always an interesting thing to talk about when you start talking about being the truth in politics. How will that work? Will that work with voters? Will that further motivate yellow dog Democrats to get out and vote for the tra transit referendum? Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know. It's always hard to, it's always hard to say. I think, uh, I mean, Joy may have this experience. I have the experience all the time of, of writing things that I think are really crucial and important, and people not paying attention to them, or sometimes they pay attention when you don't think they're going to. So it's really hard to, it's hard to take, make heads or tails of what the public's going to react to something. It seems to me the biggest bar that the pro transit people have to do is what anybody has to do if you're asking voters to vote to raise their own taxes. That's just always difficult to do. In fact, I'm not aware that it's happened in this county since 1980 when the last time the sales tax went up. And when that happened, the property tax was, was, mm -hmm. was rolled back a little bit. And I think that's partly why you're seeing the pro transit side really um, do a lot to emphasize some of the shorter term benefits uh, that they say are in the plan, whether that's improvements in local bus service things, because they're trying to tell people you don't have to wait 20 years to start feeling this plan. Did the pro-transit people make a mistake not talking about that earlier? They talked, there was so much, so much emphasis, and perhaps this is partly the media, because light rail is the shiny new toy there, right. but should they have talked about the bus and the immediate improvements that were going to happen, they say, immediately with this, and not, and not sort of wait till the end and say, oh yeah, by the way, we're doing this too? It's hard to say. I mean, I think maybe they should have, and I think you're right that probably the media, the, the light rail gets the headlines. The other thing is, though, that it, it partly feeds into the opposition argument, which is, yes, we want all those improvements, and we could do those right now for cheaper and wait and not group it all into one big plan. So I'm curious to see how that plays out. Stephen Hill, the Nashville scene, Joy Garrison, the Nashville, Tennessee, and our, our, our guests on Inside Pots. We're talking about all the things that have been going on at the courthouse. It's been a busy time up there. We've been talking about the referendum. We'll start talking about the other things that have been going on, including the upcoming special mayor's race after this break.